Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, they're in their 30s, unmarried and happy. While Americans are staying single and childless longer, some are creating different kinds of families. I talk with an author who's explored these so-called urban tribes next on Dialogue. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. A welcome as well to those of you tuning in on public radio and the World Wide Web. Magazine writer Ethan Waters was just trying to make sense of his own life when he wrote an article that defined a trend. Still in his 30s and single, Waters felt, well, fine. He had his job, financial security, and most importantly, his friends. So he decided to see what others like him were feeling. The result, a piece in which he coined the term urban tribes. It got so much response that he wrote a book by the same name. In it, Waters hypothesized that often unmarried people in cities are supported by their social networks in the same way, or even better, than they would be in their own family. I spoke with him at the Sun Valley Writers Conference. For more than a decade, the conference has been bringing together authors from around the world to talk about current issues in literature and life. I started by asking Waters about his own life when he wrote the book. I think like a lot of people, I was, I guess at the time, 35, and I uh, began to look at my life. and, and, and mostly in relationship to my parents' life, and thought, well, what were they doing at 35? And, you know, when they were 35, they had me, you know, I was four years old or, or so, and uh, they had careers that seemed much further along. They, you know, had the house in the suburbs, and, um, and you reach 35, and you're still single in the city living with your friends. It's time to take a look at your life and begin to wonder, what am I doing with this time? And, and um, there's a lot of anxiety out there in culture these days of, uh, people dismissing this time of life. And I wanted to look at this, you know, the, you know, the, the never marrieds as I call them, and the urban tribe years, and, and try, to find, try to see if there was a justification for them. Um, and what I found was, um, you know, stories that went all over the map in terms of people engaging this freedom, doing wonderful things with it, living very valuable and uh, fulfilled lives, all the way to people who were, uh, once they saw the freedom in their life, sort of froze up. They, you know, they could not figure out for the life of them what to do with that time. So there's a lot of different outcomes for, the, for those never married years, but um, I tried to focus a little bit on the, the positive ones because I think the negative ones, you know, the kids that go to college and then go and live in their mother's basement, you know, they, get, they get a lot of press these days. Or the, the friends, you know, um, you know, people that can't figure out their lives at all, they tend to get a lot of press, and, and I think there's a lot more going on in this time than we've uh, seen. Part of the phenomenon of this is, is the Internet. And uh, you, you were flooded with emails yeah. from people from around the world saying, hey, I'm part of a, That's quote, like me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm part of a, quote, urban tribe. And so what resulted is, is this book out of, out of that single article. Yeah, it's always fun as a magazine journalist to hit that note. That, you know, you do it two, two or three or hopefully four times in your career, you write the piece that everyone suddenly talks about for a little bit. Because um, and, and I think honestly, it's not that I certainly invented the notion of the urban, the, the, I didn't invent the urban tribe itself. It existed out there in culture. I gave it a name. I gave it respect uh, in that little piece for the New York Times Magazine. And and people instantly got it. And it's interesting how things in our culture can go, uh, we can be blind to them until we tell a story about them. And sometimes that's done by a, a, you know, on, you know, by a, a writer, um, sometimes it's done in other ways, but it's fun to be the first person to sort of name something and give it a story and give it a little meaning. And then all the energy that's behind those groups suddenly gets, suddenly is, is, is spoken into culture. I imagine it can start to become a little bit of a millstone, though, because you have moved on to other things, and and you know, aren't you'll always be probably associated with right. with the one phenomenon. Well, yeah, not only did I move on to other things as a writer, but I, I, I wrote about my single years, the the last year of my single life. I was I actually uh, the epilogue of the book is written from my honeymoon, and so it, in a way, it was it was me looking at my own life and and giving it its place in in time, and then moving on from it, so leaving it behind. So you wrote, I mean, you, you know, partly in response to Robert Putnam's 
um, treatise called Bowling Alone, which uh, you know pretty much bemoaned the fact that people nowadays don't seem to be joining groups like they used to that were disassociated. And your point was, well, there are these groups, yes. and actually they're they're serving a, a valid function because uh, these urban tribes, these groups of people living or working near each other, are helping each other in very real ways. In very real ways. And uh, Robert Putnam's uh, uh, book was a remarkable uh, book, and it and it tracked a very troubling trend, which is that organizations your parents belong to, the League of Women Voters, the Lions Clubs, the memberships of those things are just dropping. Off the map, you know, younger generations are not joining those groups, and he was very worried about it. I think it's right to be worried about it. What he missed, I think, was that these friendship groups are very difficult to count. They're just they exist within people's lives. There's no membership roles. There's no way to see them as a statistician. You have to go in them and ask questions about them and see them sort of on the ground. Um, and and I think I, I think it's true. That, and they do more than just you know. Uh, you know, buy the burrito for you or, you know, help you find the girlfriend. They're, he they're helping you find jobs. They're helping you negotiate uh, city life, which is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and they help in all manners of ways. In fact, in, and I would make the case in, in a lot of ways more significantly than those, those social groups that your parents belong to. Some worry about that, though. I, you know, some worry, hey, it's that's, inwardly. yeah, it's so self-centered to just be helping your friends. What about getting involved in the wider community yeah. and helping volunteer. Absolutely, and I think that's the challenge for these urban tribes. They're great at helping friendships, the, the friend, you know, the roommate, the friend, um, but what are they doing for the people that you, that aren't in your social group, you know, the people on the other side of the tracks or the, or the people that are not from your demographic group? Where can, you know, what, and, and honestly, they're not doing that much, uh, or that some of the groups are not. They really are focused on the inwardly. And I think it's the challenge for these groups, if we can identify friendship groups as, uh, you know, tell a story about them, give them a name perhaps, uh, understand that that's where our social capital lies. If only if we recognize that can we then turn that energy and say, okay, what can we do with it? What can we, how can we, you know, start a philanthropy? How can we start a group together? The San Francisco Writers Grotto, which is now an office space of 33 writers in San Francisco, um, was started with Ethan Kanan and Poe Bronson um, from this energy. It was a friendship group that became something real that now has, you know, teaches classes and does public events and brings people in and, um, and, it, and it, it was really the motivation for this book was to say, okay, recognize it, see it, now do something more with it. Like, don't just let it be a friendship group, do something more with it. Many people in these urban tribes, frankly, have the time and the luxury, uh, the money in some instances, to do this, to kind of take a break for a decade or so. You say, in the long run, most of us knew we had an ace in the hole. Many of us were in line to be the beneficiaries of the largest transfer of wealth that had ever taken place from one generation to another. So is this just kind of an elite idea that we have these? Uh, right. It is uh, a little bit. And, that, and, and, and not for the worst reasons. It's actually just for a very specific reason, which is the marriage delay itself has taken effect mostly with college-educated people and college-educated women in particular, I think, were the fuel for the delay. Suddenly, we have a generation that not only had opportunities, but were really pursuing those opportunities. They were graduating from college, doing challenging careers, or getting a master's, a PhD, and suddenly they were delaying the marriage and starting the family into the late 20s and uh, often 30s. The energy for the urban tribe comes from that group. They, they're, they're outside a family unit. They're, they're living far from their families oftentimes. They're, they're jumping from job to job or school to school. So they have to find, we're human creatures, we have to find some sort of social network and social home in our life. So it, so it tended to be, uh, you know, the college-educated kids that were, were doing this. Um, in small-town America, you still find you know, the people that don't go to college get married very young. 